I would like to begin simply by thanking, thanking our host, Bauer um, Nowakowski, for the kind invitation to, to Warsaw, how not to accept. <laughs> um, I also would like to, to thank um, Eva for the excellent organization. I would like to thank the University of Warsaw and their dignitaries for their hospitality. And I would like to thank the European Research Council for their wisdom to fund power and the Stone Masters project. In present times in which everything seems pretty awful, we very much depend on those moments of hope, of feeling that at least occasionally, good things still happen to good people. And that there can be progress even in areas where one does not always experience it as much as it would be desirable. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Kuschwitz. I'm professor of ancient cultural history at the University of Vienna. And like they did for you, Paul, um, the ERC made a dream come true for me. I too have the great fortune to be able to run an ERC project, Mapula, mapping out the poetic landscapes of the Roman Empire. Together with my excellent team of researchers, Chiara Cenati and Victoria Gonzalez, Alex Gangoli, Denisa Murzia, and Mirko Tasso, I have embarked on a five-year course of research to investigate the Carmina Epigraphica, inscribed Roman poetry that has survived from an empire that spanned from Glasgow to the Persian Gulf, from Morocco to the Black Sea, a landmass stretching over three continents and several modern time zones with a shared history of more than 1,000 years. But of course, you did not come here today to hear me talk about my own project, especially in the abstract. No, we're here to celebrate the inauguration of the Stone Masters project, a project that will help you to embark on an exciting new avenue of research and help all of us to understand much better the fundamentals and essentials behind our shared research interest, epigraphy. I hope, though, that both Power and all of you will forgive me if I cannot, of course, altogether resist the temptation to talk about my favorite subject, inscribed Roman verse today. I now would like to begin my actual presentation with something that I would like to call a glitch in the matrix. I never really know just how dated my cultural references are, and on how fertile a ground they fall in the realm of classical scholarship. But I have some hope that most, if not all of you, actually do know what I refer to with this expression. The Matrix is the title of a hugely important and influential 1999 film. It is based on the idea that humankind lives in a computer-generated fantasy world in which they function as slaves to artificial intelligence that spiraled out of human control. Personally, I blame this film for much of what we see today in terms of belief in conspiracy theories, the deep state and whatnot, but in my desire to talk about a glitch in the matrix today, I simply would like to use the thought model of this film and apply it to the topic of my talk and the role of the Roman Stonecutters Workshop. In doing so, I will offer no pills, neither red nor blue or any other color for that matter. What I would like to offer you instead is the following inscription as the starting point of an intellectual journey of discovery into the world of Roman verse inscriptions as special and not so special orders from the stonemasons workshop. A journey that will touch on realities just as much as on imaginations, for to my mind, the poetic and image-based ways in which we think and talk um, matters just as um, talk about matters are just as significant and consequential as the ways in which things actually are or seem to be. The first inscription that I show you now, inscribed on a sizable, albeit slightly damaged, marble kippus and tentatively dated to the mid-first century AD, was discovered in Brixia, Brescia, in the region of Venetia at Histria in Italy. Visually, the inscribed text consists of two distinct parts, a prose inscription in relatively large letters, 
slightly decreasing in size from line one to six, with a clear break-off point in line six with those three letters of an abbreviation widely spaced out. And then a smaller, densely lettered part of three lines, lines seven to nine, drawing its readership closer to the text and thus increasing the level of familiarity with proximity. This latter part, excuse me, this latter part contains a short poem in lines eight and nine. The prose part is a formulaic expression of how the monument came about and who has been commemorated in it. The poem, written in iambic scenarii and arranged by its metrical lines, is a short reflection of a, on a life filled with adversities, suggesting that death may have come as a relief after all, raising the obvious question whether this life was ended voluntarily rather than by natural causes. But let us look at the actual text of the inscription. I'll just read the, the English translation here. Lucius Naividius, son of Gaius, of the tribus Fabia Sevir Augustalis, ordered to have this made according to his testament for himself and the or his freed women Vitalis, Fausta, Gnome, and Fida. Then this little poem. During a long life, I encountered many adversities. At an appropriate time, tired of this age, I retired. You will, of course, immediately have spotted the oddity, line seven, written in prose, though technically belonging to the part in fine print, so to speak, saying, Deinde hoc elogium breve, then this little poem. To the best of my knowledge, there is no parallel for such a statement in the Latin inscriptions. So what might it mean? The most plausible explanation of and for this statement would seem to be the following one. The person who composed the monument's text and considered its layout um, envisioned very much the layout that we still see today. To distinguish between the more official part of the inscription in prose and in taller letters and the more private element of the little poem, he felt that the stone cutter might benefit from a little note, I think. From a little note highlighting this transition Arguably, the deceased himself stipulated the text and its layout in his testamentum. The craftsman, in turn, would appear not to have taken these words as the stage direction they were meant to be, addressing himself, the stonecutter, for information prior to cutting the text into the stone, presumably because he was not expecting any in-text instructions. A lack of attention to the significance of words, merely seeing them as inscribable mass. And thus, the stage direction, and then this little short poem, um, the stage direction for the stonecutters, with its letters seen and inscribed, rather than its message read and understood, ended up on display on the tombstone from Brixia. This reminds me somehow of a curious incident of how an automated out-of-office message stating, I'm not in the office at the moment, send any work to be translated, dot, 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 sent by the in-house English-Welsh translation service of Swansea Council, ended up on a bilingual road sign, informing only its English readers that lorries were barred from a road near a supermarket, while for once leaving the Welsh readership rather puzzled at best. Returning, from, um, returning to the inscription from Brixia, it goes without saying, of course, that some scholars, even the usually impeccable Franz Büchler, jumped to the rescue of the stonecutter's reputation, suggesting that this wasn't just an oversight, a lack of attention to, to, to detail or pure incompetence or um, inability to, to read properly, um, suggesting that the words de inde hoc elogium brewe were actually meant to be part of the text and that they might even scan metrically. I'm not sure, however, that this is really doing the stonecutter or anyone any favors. I think we might cut him a better deal if we assume merely an oversight rather than the willful introduction of a completely idiotic, terrifyingly obvious and completely meaningless element to this text um, that does not carry the content in any way. 
Dein der hoc elogium brewe certainly was a special order, and, jokes aside, the stonecutter clearly delivered in terms of actual layout and design. And you see immediately that Carmina Epigraphica really do require some special attention and elevated level of care in their execution. At the same time, I believe we now have got a first glimpse of the matrix. The intricate and almost seamlessly connected and interwoven network of processes and make-believe behind inscribed and poetic texts, the workings behind the object that pretends to be a mixture of communication and artwork of material objects whose function we commonly do not challenge, because it's obvious, and whose production we do not normally take into account because it seems to be of little relevance for the communicative offer these pieces make. But can we, should we separate the production aspect from the reception aspect of our inscribed objects? May we learn something that is mutually relevant for production and reception, and thus for the real life as well as imagined value, function, and perception of our inscriptions? Now that we have taken an important step from within to an outside vantage point to behold that matrix, so to speak, why don't we go and see what we can explore together and where such a route might lead us? I propose we start with the very surface of our inscriptions, and especially the Carmina Epigraphica, and move away from it gradually, one step at a time, to behold the artifice and craftsmanship in its entirety by the end of this process. While allegations of superficiality tend to hurt serious scholars, accustomed to exploring depth rather than merely polished surfaces, I very much doubt that there's anything wrong with looking at surfaces when it comes to Roman poetry inscribed and literary. In fact, I would argue, if anything, we should dare to be more superficial, dare to be more interested in surfaces, for they matter a great deal and they have a direct relevance even to the deepest poems. Catullus famously opens his libellus as follows. To whom am I to present my pretty new book, freshly smoothed off with a dry pumice stone? To you, Cornelius, for you used to think that my trifles were worth something long ago when you took courage, you alone of Italians, to set forth the whole history of the world in three volumes, learned volumes, by Jupiter and laboriously wrought. Of course, you may focus on the contrast between the Alexandrian-style learned lightheartedness of the Lepidus Libellus and the truly archaic, titanic, I mean, Jupiter is mentioned, titanic sensation of three hefty tomes of history. There's certainly nothing wrong or new with that. But at the same time, compare the contrast, the tactile sensation of a collection of poems that is small and um, freshly made, smoothened off with dry pumice, and compare that contrast that with the sensation that comes with three cartae that need to be expanded, explicare, and sound a lot like um, physical as well as intellectual labor. Is this aspect, though directly related to production, really so superficial and irrelevant when it comes to perception and reception? And if you still have any doubts, compare these two options um, with a third scenario as imagined playfully in a well-known epigram of Marshall that reads as follows. You're afraid, Ligura, of my writing verses against you, a brief, lively poem, and you long to seem worthy of such an apprehension. But idle is your fear, and idle your desire. Libyan lions roar at bulls, they do not trouble butterflies. I advise you, if you're anxious to be read, to look for some boozy poet of the dark archway who writes verses with rough charcoal or crumbling chalk, which folk read while they, can I say that word in this esteemed hall? It's on the, anyway. This brow of yours is not for marking with my brand. This poem, which of course receives frequent attention in scholarly and semi-scholarly publications on the graffiti of Pompeii and Herculaneum, 
sees Marshall making reference to some Micellus poetaster, who is characterized as drunk and inhabiting some dark, undesirable place. This person typically writes his poetic effusions on the walls where the Cacantes may see them, using charcoal and chalk instead of proper writing materials for a proper audience. Sensory overload, for sure, yet of a kind that should teach us a lesson or two about the tremendous relevance of surfaces, writing, and location in the production of inscriptions, including graffiti, when it comes to their reception and evaluation. Things do not stop here, and I would like to show you a third literary text before we return to actual inscriptions, and this third text will add another intellectual dimension to the notion of poetry and surface, one that is in fact directly relevant to inscriptions, although I doubt that any epigraphist has ever really bothered to look at this passage in noteworthy detail. One of the most remarkable yet consistently underused treasure houses for a better understanding of Roman imperial poetry has to be the first satire of Perseus, um, the satirist of the Neronian age. In this dialogue, Perseus has his poetic eye say to his interlocutor, what do you think? That poetry now at last flows with smooth rhythm so that critical fingernails glide smoothly over the joints. The modern poet knows how to make a line as straight as if he were stretching a plumb line with one eye closed. Whether his project is to speak against morality, luxury, or the banquets of lords, the muse provides our poet with grand material. To be sure, Perseus is not complimentary about the stage of poetic production and performance of his own time. He diagnoses in it a mixture of the dull, the bland, and exaggerated display of fake, unfelt emotions. So basically the same as any episode of the X Factor, Pop Idol, America's Got Talent, and whatever else Simon Cowell and others of that ilk produce for TV audiences worldwide. Poetry of this type, Perseus says, is characterized by its smooth surface, a surface so smooth that when you run your fingernails across, you cannot even feel the joints of the building blocks that were used in its composition, and a composition to um, um, carefully construed, so carefully construed that it is as straight as if it were made with a poetic plummet. Perfection is scary, of course, and for that reason, whenever scholars are confronted with it, they have two diametrically opposed responses. Either they worship it, or they dismiss it as superficial and without depth, and therefore without true meaning. In poetry, smooth compositions are good when your name is Horace, whereas a carefully crafted epigraphic poem may still be a mere concoction of a talentless hack, so to speak. In architecture and sculpture, and you're surrounded by it, obviously, perfection is somehow good, whereas lack of it ranges somewhere on the scale that stretches from the charming, individual, and quaint to the grossly incompetent and downright disastrous. In epigraphy and in stonemasonry, as its productive prerequisite, these two worlds easily clash, and they clash all the more frequently when Carmina Epigraphica enter the equation. A poem's value, according to some scholar, um, apparently may decrease with its lack of formal presentation. Whereas even the neatest of presentation apparently cannot salvage a composition from its condemnation to the miscellus poetaster circle of artistic hell. It is hard to believe that in classical scholarship of the 21st century, we still operate in these terms, but I only exaggerate ever so slightly, as all of you well know, if you are familiar with relevant scholarship. Before we get too depressed, however, perhaps it's better to move on and consider two inscriptions that, in the spirit of this first glitch in the matrix, help us to make sense of surface and material choices, ultimately chosen at random, though certainly not without representativeness in mind. The first piece that I would like to bring to your attention is a segment of a much longer poem from the famous monument of the Flavii at Kilium in the province of Africa Proconsularis. Um, 
you see the the building in, in various stages here on on the screen. Um, the 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 piece de resistance is that originally it was also equipped with a um, cockroach shaped weather vane which has gone missing. Maybe it flew away or something. I don't know. Passage of the text that I'm interested in, extensively celebrating the monument as an expression of pietas, of filial duty, reads as follows. What does a sense of filial duty not achieve? Behold, the gaping stonework with many a light crack invites enchanting bees to go inside and to build their waxy nests, so that this home forever will exude a sweet scent from the nectar of time when new honey produces flower-dripping juices. An article that I co-wrote with my team members Chiara Cenati and Victoria Gonzalez recently, we have discussed the sensory aspects related to epigraphy, including scent, as palpable in this passage. Here I would like to use this text to illustrate another point, however, and that point is the interplay between the inscription's text, the monument, and the stonemasonry. The poem itself, a delightful and elegant composition, and with 110 lines in total, one of the longest Carmina Latina epigraphica in existence, is inscribed on a monumental mausoleum, and the text reveals the architectural, decorative, and even landscaping care that has gone into the creation of this family tomb. We are without a doubt looking at perfection here in, on many levels, and the author of the poem does not even attempt to conceal his pride in what he and his family has achieved. The monument is described as expensive, tall, everlasting, novel, gleaming a structure. In Edward Courtney's translation um, of a passage preceding the one that I have just presented to you, we read, Now, if sensation survives after death, I would not doubt that your father, Secundus, in the silent shades of Aharon, often rejoices and spurns the other groups of ghosts, because he realizes that here on earth there remains this impressive tomb in its eternal novelty that the shining, well-fitted slabs stand as they do, that the levels of steps raised from the foundation have grown finer, so that every corner has been traced as if with the stuff of malleable wax. Sprightly sculpture constitutes an innovation in a mobile effigy, and the crowd passing by can continually applaud, applaud these adornments and be amazed at the matching columns which gleam overhead. He often sees the delights which he himself bestowed on the place in producing an abundance of the gifts of Bacchus and desiring to lay out the first vines and making the grove flourish by many diversions of the stream. Yet the building is not reduced to its gleaming, shiny, perfect surface. As the earlier passage shows, the cracks in between, the gaps and Joints allow access to depth, and this is where bees were meant to be able to build their nests, adding a scented depth to both the architectural structure and thus the experience of the inscription, written all across the facade of the tomb for eternity. All of this contributes to the text's um, reception for sure. At the same time, we are looking at the planful production, at the careful planning and the multidimensional and multi-sensory consideration of those whose inscription we now still read. A smooth surface, without cracks, without inner workings, would be less, not more, in terms of aesthetic experience, even if, we're, even if one were just interested in the inscription, not the monument itself. Material perfection, value, and sensory experiences are considered in a significant range of cases, and usually, like in the case of the Flavii monument, the reception angle is the main take of the inscribed poem. Consider, for example, the sarcophagus of Lollia Procla from Vercelle, um, datable to the end of the first or early second century. Only um, read out the, the final few few lines. Purple flowers transformed into beautiful, missing will color your tombstone and the shining lettering in this inscription, distinct to the white gleam of the stone, declares her name. In a full-blown attack on our senses, 
This piece combines elements of sound, of scent, of vision, of touch in its self-presentation, drawing attention to the material qualities of the inscribed object, how it appears gleaming with shining letters, and possibly to gain additional colors on the spectrum from the flowers to be placed on it. With high quality materials and excellent craftsmanship come appreciation and distinction. And that is precisely a point that is made in a second century um, inscription from Sarsina, Sarsina in Umbria. A stone that does not look like much upon inspection, but whose inscribed text also explains to us just why it does not look like much. If only I were able to present you with such gifts as you deserve, as prizes for the praise that you receive, this inscription would have to be made of gold, and the writing of your name should be read in golden decoration. You, who in such a simple life were always so welcome to those above, I pray that she is among the untroubled and without a fault in her life, and on top of that, may the earth rest lightly on you. The grieving widower here suggests that he is struggling to express his appreciation for his um, former freed woman than wife appropriately. Her merita as a conjux benemerens far exceed the munera that he is able to give her in the shape of this funerary monument. The entire monument, and especially the letters that form the deceased names, um, ought to be executed in gold. This would be appropriate as a reward, as munera, and as prize, premia, for a woman whose simplex vita, blameless throughout, was admired by all. Only gold would be good enough, both for the production and the appropriate level of appreciation at the point of reception. But with that, we are already moving on from surfaces and materials to the actual lettering of inscriptions. Alphidia Agates inscription and its material related imagery combining both the production and the reception angle is best be contextualized with an inscription that was discovered in Bowness on Solway in Britain. The British parallel is both entirely unremarkable in its appearance and astonishing in its content. Its, texts, um, its text reads as follows. I, Antonianus, um, Antonianus uh, dedicate something, but part of the text is missing. If that an increase in earnings, so somebody is asking for a pay rise effectively, right? Give that an increase in earnings fills my vows with credibility, and soon I will dedicate a Carmen with golden letters executed one by one. That's the most peculiar use of viritim I have ever seen. Here the level of epigraphical self-referentiality has reached an exceptional level. Not only does this dedicant show full control over the monument and its inscription, but he playfully combines two motifs in this Carmen. Just as the gods should fill the dedicant's vota and add to his riches, he in turn promises A, to procure a new inscription, another Carmen, and um, B, to execute that Carmen, which in itself is already a valuable gift in and of its own right, to render it more precious still through its material execution. You will not just get a poem, but I will make sure it's filled in gold. And thus, when I previously described a Carmen as a special order from the stonecutter in its execution, now the Carmen itself has become something special that is made to order of the gods, that is, something that can be made custom-made depending on the inherent divine customer's generosity. I don't wish to spend too much time on the relation between poetry and typography. In some way, the two previous examples from Bowness and Sarasina already make the point rather clearly. Poetry as art is a precious gift in and of itself, a sculpture executed in the material of words, so to speak, and it is, at least in an intellectual exercise, possible to, um, to imagine the gift's increase in value if executed in better quality or in materials of a higher expense. 
This should not cloud our judgment of the quality of the Carmina themselves. Authenticity, genuine emotion, and an ability to connect and resonate with an audience on a deeply human level must never take a backseat to cosmetics, of course. Content must not yield to form in this area, no matter what any Alexandrian poet scholars thought about this matter. But merely on the level of lettering, we cannot move on, of course, without at least mentioning two more aspects in which the production angle and the work in the Stonecutter's workshop are of the utmost importance to consider. The first and obvious aspect is the special lettering developed by Furius Dionysius Philocalus, calligrapher of the fourth century AD, who by order of Pope Damasus I, designed the funerary inscriptions for the popes and early martyrs that are now known as the Epigrammata Damasiana, written in the so-called Philokalian script, here illustrated by the epitaph of Saint Agnes. Designed to stand out, these letters prove to be both revolutionary and consequential in terms of their afterlife well into the Middle Ages similar to, for example, the development of the Capitalis Quadrata of the Augustan period. The main difference here, however, is that the Philokalian letters, at least initially, are very much directly related to poetry, whereas earlier Roman typefaces were, from their very beginning, significantly more universal in their use. Damasus' epigrams and their iconic Philokalian letters, in turn, stand out among the inscriptions of their own time, and that was, of course, the whole point of this all along. The second aspect that must be mentioned, of course, in which design, production, and reception of the very letters go hand in hand, and in which texts also draw attention to their own production and layout, are, of course, inscriptions and in vast majorities, these are verse inscriptions that exhibit acrostics, telestics, and sometimes even mesostics. I will only show you one, examples of, um, one example of many from across the Roman world, the second century inscription for one Titus Aelius Faustus, oil merchant by imperial appointment from the city of Rome. Here lies Titus Aelius Faustus, simple in his demeanor, who spent 28 years in the light of life. Antoninus and also Commodus, ruling together, gave him permission to offer fat liquid to the people. This man led a rare life, and his reputation was of a type most rarely seen, but always envious of decent people, Fortuna's way. To discover the nickname that he had while life lasted, select those eight letters from the eight lines and you will see the name Macarius emerging here. It's not difficult to see the level of sophisticated planning that has gone into the design of the poem, its layout in 16 lines, with each even line indented so as to make the beginning of all odd lines, and by that I mean just their respective first letters, stick out to the left. The production of a meaningful text that would still spell out the signum, the nickname of the deceased, and finally to include the final part that draws the reader's attention to the artifice, just in case they had missed it for some reason. In doing so, the text is not only self-deprecating, literulas in the diminutive, but also numerically specific, versus octo, for no other reason than to highlight the level of planning even more than is already obvious from everything else. And with that, we are now ready, I think, to embark on the next level, moving on from surfaces, materials, and letters to more elaborate arrangements still, revealing the extent to which poetic texts truly are special orders and how much they are aware of it, but also moving on to conceptualize the process as a whole through imagery and figures of thought. Reference to the number of lines to be considered on one's hunt for the acrostic in the inscription from Rome finds a remarkable parallel in a verse inscription from Conimbriga in Lusitania, Portugal. The inscription for one Valerius Avitus, belonging to the later second century and preserved only through a manuscript tradition, reads as follows. 
to the divine Manes, to Valerius Avitus, son of Valerius Marinos, aged 30. Valeria Fuscilla, his mother, had this set up for her most loving, dutiful, and obedient son. I want five little verses adequately to be written on my stone. I, Valerius Avitus, wrote this, born in Conimbriga, that death snatched me away suddenly. I lived three times ten years without any blame in life. Live who you will live, I urge you. Death awaits everyone. Sorry, I didn't mean to spoil the mood. <laughs> um, this text is either a stroke of pure genius or complete shambles. I'm not sure. Um, it depends on your own predilections. Some scholars, somewhat more on the pessimistic side, suggest that considering that the poem is but a hodgepodge made, of, uh, made up of numerous borrowings from literary poets. But it is possible that in their interpretation, these scholars are falling for an apparent trap, namely the not altogether uncommon diminutive versiculi little verses. For one cannot but notice the ambiguity of the diminutive on the semantically ambiguous term versus, which can denote both a physical line of a text and a rhythmical line or verse. One editor suggested that one ought to see the use of the diminutive versiculi justified in the writer's desire to appear as modest. Little lines. This is an appealing suggestion, of course. Looking at the overall layout of the text, however, try to increase the looking at the overall layout of the text, however, as represented in the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum on the basis of the manuscript tradition, one must note that each of the initial eleven lines cons contains significantly fewer letters than each of those in the poetic part, and that they were executed in a much smaller script. In that regard. The little verses, the versiculi of the poem, are indeed little verses, comparatively speaking, as regards the actual size of the letters. If one takes the term versiculus to mean physical line, then there's nothing else to say about the expression versiculus quinque, as the text has indeed been laid out over five lines. Yet, why would it matter? to anyone over just how many lines exactly any given text is laid out on a tombstone. In that regard, it might seem safer to assume that what the author of this text had in mind was the metrical line, the verse, rather than the physical line. If that is the case, however, what about the diminutive versiculi, which seems to describe the design of the text so appropriately? Is it possible to reconcile the two and thus to acknowledge a double meaning of the diminutive, both as an expression of modesty and a reference to the text physical execution? It's impossible to answer this question without giving some consideration to a related one, namely the actual meaning of hoc scripsi. I wrote this in line 13. Possible explanations, of course, range from I composed these lines to I took care of the inscribed writings, Considering, though, that Avitus' mother had only just stated to have taken care of this monument, Boswit, the latter is somewhat more unlikely than the former. Note, however, that this inscribed monument displays a number of graphic elements that hint towards the deceased interests in writing. To the left of the mother's part of the inscription, there's a volumen apertum, an open book scroll, and pugilares, um, writing tablets. To the right, in addition to a frame with 30 elevated dots on what looks like a proto-abacus, there was another volumen apertum and a theca calamaria, so a vessel with writing implements. At the bottom, both the pugilares and the theca calamaria motifs were repeated, further decorated with a garland. All of this hints towards an active interest of Avitus in writing, but not so much necessarily in inscribing, and potentially a certain literary interest. So, did Avitus write the poem? There's writing, and then there's creative writing and composing, of course, and it has been observed before that this short piece, in keeping with established traditions of the genre, to be fair, relies on a number of borrowings and creative adaptations from other poets and poems, in addition to topical phrases. Moreover, one can be reasonably sure um, 
that however much Avitus contributed to the final text without creatively acquiring material from other poets, he did not contribute everything. How exactly, one must ask, was he to know that he, um, that he should live ter denos annos, unless his death was a long and predictable one, a death that allowed him to compose the lines around these numbers. I suggested at the beginning of my paper um, that we should look at what we prefer to think of as realities just as much as we ought to consider imaginations, for they too usually tell us something very real and significant. We have now reached significant distance from the matrix in so far as we are at least at an arm's, if not a good view's length away from the system um, navigating between production, reception, and conceptualization. We have seen surfaces and materials, we have seen the lettering, and we have seen the ordinatio. But I would like to take one more step with you, one further step with you at least, and that step is to the actual process of inscribing, something that sounds technical and physical at first, but as we will see in the world of the Roman verse inscriptions, does not end there. Considering, consider the following extraordinary inscription from Salona, Soline in Dalmatia, expressing the trauma and pain of a disastrous birth that saw the death of a child as well as that of a mother, trauma and pain in undiluted, unmitigated force. I will only read the first lines. O Isos, even though exhausted, we hesitate to inscribe these verses, for as we are moved by this sad funeral, our sadness is thus removed with every stroke of the hammer and chisel. We still dare to make this public together with our lamentation. There is no difference here between the hammering pains felt by the relatives and the impact of the hammer and chisel upon the surface. Every blow of the hammer equals the numb pains felt by those left behind. A powerful image involving the dedicants of this piece in its production at the most basic physical level, even if they hardly inscribe these words themselves. We have come a long way since the artifice, the matrix of epigraphical make-believe to disguise the technical production-related aspects of Roman inscriptions had begun to unravel with a harmless little accident. When the construction de inde hoc elogium breve broke the fourth wall in a rare case of Roman meta-epigraphy to borrow and adapt the term meta-theater for this purpose. The original Matrix film was followed by the sequel, The Matrix Reloaded, and I too feel the need to restore the Matrix now, to re-immerse myself into the world of poetry and artistry, in which everything is both very much and not at all as it would at first appear. How can I achieve that? Well, first of all, I can show you a drawing made by the German scholar Heinrich Dessau, based on the reports of his French colleague Stefan Gsell, regarding a fragmentary inscription from Madauros in Algeria. The text simply reads as follows, sacrificed frequently and gladly to the Moorish gods. But, and here comes the matrix, the text was inscribed as a giant magic square over and over again in a grid of 37 by 37. And for those of you who are equally good at maths as I am, I calculate this, this must be 1,369 little squares. And the text ran across the square vertically, horizontally, and diagonally. There is no time here to discuss the underlying magic and numerology. I refer you to an excellent explanation by Manfred Schmidt on his webpage kustos-corporis.com slash blog, where this item is explained more fully. Secondly, let us be reconciled with the matrix by noting that every now and then our paranoia to witness meta-epigraphy leads us astray, seeing clues where there are none. There's a firmly held belief in the field of Roman epigraphy as regards the existence of model books that gave stonecutters advice on how to word their inscriptions, the evidence for which still remains to be seen. 
But have a look at what Robert Ireland in Martin Hennig's Handbook of Roman Art, uh, Oxford 1983, says. Conventional texts could be extracted from collections of ready-made formulae. Verses identical, save for the names of the deceased, which often fail to scan, reappear in metrical epitaphs from different parts of the empire, and one artist made the careless but revealing error of copying his pattern text unmodified onto the stone. Hic jacet corpus puri nominandi, that is roughly, here lies the body of a boy put name in here. This view has been regurgitated many a times by many key influential and respected scholars, and I do not wish to make fun of them. Others have suggested that the word nominandus might just mean that the boy had not yet been given a personal name. But those, what, what those, of, um, those who came up with these suggestions all have in common, I would like to argue, is that they should have read beyond the convenient quote. Sometimes that really helps. Here's what the piece that Ireland quoted, a verse inscription from Hippo Regius in Algeria, actually says. Here lies the body of a noteworthy boy, the Puri Nominandi. O oh, blessed boy, after but a few days, earth has taken possession of you again, still an infant, and sent you to the realm of heaven. You were born so that you obtain such wealth, reborn, and you see in the final line, Renatus, which incidentally is a name, obtained um, such wealth as an alternative um, translation. I think I have good reasons to suggest that Ireland's and others' interpretations are wildly mistaken, and that the assumption that the puri numenandi might mean as much as NN, though potentially amusing, is nothing but a myth. Let me start with the easy part. This piece is metrical, even though it does not adhere to literary abstractions of meter. It's perfectly within the limits of popular dactylic verse, as, wi as widely evidenced in the inscription. So could nominandus mean yet to be named if the boy were to have died before given his actual name? Impossible. With the erection of the tombstone, the last meaningful opportunity to impose a name was gone. What would be the point of giving him a name after this monumental commemoration? Could it mean insert name here? Maybe, but it does not. There's sufficient evidence for the use of memorandus to signify either yet to be mentioned, as in below, or noteworthy. There's no evidence, however, for it to mean must be mentioned here, in the way interpreters have suggested. But anyway, let us skip this matter for now and try instead to make sense of the text. Here lies the body of a memorandus boy. O oh, blessed boy, after but a few days, earth has taken possession of you again, still an infant, and sent you back to the realm of heaven. And now for the crucial part. You were born for the purpose of obtaining such possession. Renatus. Holding such possessions, reborn? Of course, that works for the poor nominandus only after his being born again. So what we see here, I would argue, is a form of playful etymologizing commemoration, which is perfectly common in the Latin verse inscription, as several scholars have shown. The name was indeed Memorandus, still to be mentioned, of a boy to be commemorated, Memorandus. The name and only Marek and subsequently in a review article Hogma appear to have noted that before was of course Renatus and I find with his name restored, the poor Nominandus, the poor Benedictus has come a little bit closer to being born again, just as we, I believe, find ourselves carefully realigned with the matrix now, if aware of its extent and its powers. There's much more one may wish to consider from the well-known advertising inscriptions of ancient stonecutters workshops to the tradition of epigraphical instruction manuals, such as, for example, that of Gaetano Buganza, L'Arte di Comporre l'Iscrizione Latine, who has a whole chapter devoted to verse inscriptions. I dealt with that in a piece published in the journal Latinitas in 2016, but I have definitely run out of time. So instead of anything else after this tour de force, 
um, through a substantial range of what I believe is remarkable evidence for a more integrated, more conceptualized approach of connecting production and reception aspects of Roman verse inscription, marrying the world of realia with a cosmos of imagery, I would like to conclude with an inscription just um, like the one that has mentioned bees and the scent of honey, an inscription that comes from Kilium in Tunisia. It reads as follows. Find out for how many years he lived that you will, that you will not learn from me. The inscriptions that has been placed ahead of your own voice will tell you such a thing which is placed above. There you may wish perchance to read everything in detail. We shall say, behold the towering peak through which this monument raises itself into the clouds close to the star-spangled sky. We may learn many things from inscriptions, including what is written and how it is written in other texts. But we must never cease to focus on the bigger picture. We must never cease to immerse ourselves in the world of poetic conceptualization, allowing us access to vantage points unparalleled, and allowing us to rethink even some of the seemingly most basic aspect of the subject of our study and the artifice behind it. After all, it was a stonecutter's workshop too that was responsible to carve this text into its monument and that executed this monument with its towering peak through which this monument raises itself into the clouds close to the star-spangled sky. However, I wish you and your team and your project the best of luck and the success you all so richly deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Peter, for this brilliant presentation of what uh, verse inscriptions bring into the question of workshop and uh, inscriptions made to order. And I can assure you that the uh, conclusion of most of your poems that death awaits us all is not the only conclusion which you are going to remember after this talk. So, uh, I was going to ask you a question because we have uh, some free time, mm, or actually thank you for uh, highlighting several issues. One is uh, actually this, how careful we have to be in tracing those glitches or uh, presumed errors by stone cutters, how you showed us, because still it's one of the main methods of uh, looking for the textbooks, which are probably present in uh, most, if not every, stone cutters workshops with professionally deals with the making of inscriptions. And uh, it's actually a general rule of the text criticism that we look for errors, and errors are often more meaningful than uh, the correct text, and as every classical philologist can tell you. So uh, it was really marvelous how you showed that the later case of the boy who is still to be named can actually be a misinterpreted error or an error on our side because it's very widely uh, cited in literature on uh, epigraphical textbooks and we'll probably return to this problem later on today. So thanks for this. And the other thing was actually the multitude of uh, authors and people who were involved in the making of such uh, poems, like you cited Catullus at the beginning, and uh, he mentioned all those low-level, street-level poets, actually, who offer their uh, uh, art, their work, their works to people who can pay them, actually, pennies for this. So it's not uh, something, um, it's really affordable, and, and you, it's not easy to find a person who could do this. But I was going to ask you a question that in the world of antiquity where everyone goes through a classical curriculum with emphasis on rhetorics and and they study uh, uh, epic poetry, is it really necessary to have a poet around to uh, have such a verse inscription written for a family member? Or do some family members of the deceased can uh, try to write it themselves. They, they take this effort to, to compose it, perhaps to better stress their feelings. I, I think this is a, a really important question to, to ask and um, want to revisit all the time again and again. Um, 
I'm as pessimistic as as many of my many of my colleagues that it requires um, several degrees in classical philology to come up with a with a short. Maybe you need these degrees in classical philology to make sure that all these metrical extra laws that you need to follow and that only a German classical philologist of the 19th century can comprehend to, to get that right. Um, but I, I think we, I mean, simply starting with our own experience, if we see people writing, writing poetry, composing poetry, performing poetry, performing song, writing song, I mean, Many of them aren't university professors, and that's probably a good thing, um, because they they talk about their own experiences with with lives that are probably a lot more diverse and colorful than than ours. Um, words are very cheap material. We all have an infinite number of them, and we can reconfigure them all the time, and we can see what works and what doesn't, and we can get into the the, the swing of it. So my suspicion is that, um, I mean, yes, if you want to quote Virgil, you probably should have heard somewhere. Um, but even even there, I'm not not too sure because, you know, many many years ago, I I opened an edition of. of Goethe, the, the, the German poet, and I thought, wow, that's full of Goethe quotes, and I had never any idea that they were actually by him. So is it thinkable that it was the same in, in the ancient world? No, I don't think it requires a lot of pattern books. It doesn't require an extensive um, years-long education to come up with these um, poems. Um, we need some explanations for the question, how come we see the same text in multiple places? But I think we'd better study Roman roads than um, handbooks and simply see how are they actually connected and in, in what sequence. Um, there must have been these books, I'm, I, 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 I have no, no doubt. But I, I very much would challenge the view um, that it requires a very high level of education to come up with a poem in which you express the way you feel in a way that is both aesthetically pleasing and rhythmically not um, offensive. Thank you. And even more, as actually the making of epigraphic poetry is to some extent actually rearranging uh, the formulae which you learn, which you can draw from uh, poets like Homer or the epic poets and then put them in a different order, place them here and there in your poem and they fill in the space which you uh, have to cover. So. I mean, another thing we should ask is that when, when we encounter these formula, if, if, if they're actually as, as meaningless and regurgitated as some people seem to, to think, I mean, um, when we go to a cemetery and, and, and read Rest in Peace, I mean, most of the time people actually feel this. They don't write it because there was some space left on the stone. And yes, hundreds and thousands of other people have also written it, but they also meant it. So their reason for, for existence, and it doesn't mean that they don't carry a deep meaning to the person using them, we'd be better off looking at the combination of formulae and we'll see how has this been reconfigured um, to mean something specific to a specific. But there will always be the person who goes for the default, you know, for the, for the Times New Roman of poets, um, poetry, that's possible. But um, I wouldn't say that this is... But the problem of looking into the minds of the people who are gone now. So. <laughs> and uh, are there any questions uh, from the audience? Yeah, Małgosia? Let me give you a microphone. Uh, so, uh, do, do we actually know uh, such uh, situations where several inscriptions uh, contain the same poem, uh, which may suggest that they were, there, there were some textbooks uh, used in uh, stonecutters' uh, workshops? Or do we know anything about uh, some ancient authors who were paid for such services? Um, this this connects to the, the the question that you that you raised, and I I think it's it's a really important question. The, the The problem is basically how we have dealt with this question in the past. Um, it is a reasonable assumption to make that there were manuals instructing stone cutters how to do their job. We see this for other parts of um, the the ancient world. For, 
No, no, I, I, I get to your point. I, I think I understand the, the, the question. Um, so the, the assumption that there were also manuals with um, poems that could be repeated is not altogether absurd. The problem starts here. There aren't actually that many poems that get um, repeated verbatim. So that must have been a very slim manual, like two pages A4. The other problem I have is that um, in this 19th century approach, I don't think I mean that as an insult, but in this 19th century um, approach of um, collecting texts that look identical and then saying this must have been a manual, um, this was done in a way that I would like to describe as philological. Now, I have background in classical philology, so I'm insulting myself here. But the problem is, of course, that um, we don't look at the geographical spread, at the chronological spread, um, um, and of the, the various ways in which we could connect these dots. Now, in a recent study, I have tried this out with a poem that is um, attested from the mid-2nd century BC to the end of the 1st century BC. There are a dozen or so examples of this. I've, I've simply put them on a map. And um, I've tried to, to um, classify them roughly by date as much as it's possible in, in these circumstances. And it's very obvious that the, the, the starting point for this is, um, is a tomb somewhere on the Italian east coast um, at the, the center of a road network. And from there, chronologically, it spreads out in a number of ways. Now, if that means that somebody stole the manual of the stone cutter locally or simply thought, that's a cool text, I'd like that too, I'll carry it with me for 50 kilometers. Um, make up your mind. I think for each and every one of these formulae, it would be really not just interesting, but vitally important to see if we can um, find similar, um, similar mechanics behind it. And in this context, my, my colleague uh, Victoria Gonzalez has, has looked at um, another formula and seen that it's probably certain units of the Roman army that transmitted them. So we should simply be open to the possibility, I think, that there are other modes of transmitting than giving a um, a stone cutter and instruction manual. Again, I'm not ruling them out. They're, they're highly plausible. We just don't have the evidence. Um, but they're highly plausible. But for poems, there could be other forms of, of um, transmission. We don't need a manual to come up with the, the annual roses are red and violets are blue poem and to make our own spin on it. We just need the internet to remind us, oh, it's that time of year again. So short answer to your question. Could it have been in manuals? Yes. Is that the only explanation? No. Is that the best explanation? I'm not so sure. I hope that roughly answers your question. Otherwise, I can drone on for another 10 minutes, but then you'll never eat. Of course. <laughs> I've also asked you if uh, we know any ancient authors, maybe from literary source, sources, uh, that were paid for such services, for composing such poems, uh, for, uh, I don't know, for some public fi figures? I'm, I'm unaware of them. Um, that doesn't mean much, but I'm, I'm unaware of this. Um, not even our local village poet produced this. I, I am aware of people self-describing as poets in, in, in this context, even from next door to Vienna in, in Carnuntum. There's somebody who says he's a verse um, smith, so to speak. Um, I'll Greek uh, term, but that doesn't mean that he produced these kind of texts. The, the origin of this story of um, poems being sold in this way is actually a, um, a story in Plutarch, I think, um, on the, the uh, Oracle of Delphi. Um, there it says that the, the, um, the priestesses had like prefabricated poems and could just quickly come up with something that looks um, spontaneous and you know that when you want to be spontaneous you're better well prepared otherwise it's 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 a disaster so that is the the whole origin of the story that there may have been um, poems prefabricated um, pre-sold and in in circulation so again the short answer that you deserved I'm unaware of them but that so much thank you I think that 
Okay, Ida had a question, but she may ask it in the during the break. But thank you for this. I think we can continue discussing this uh, journeys of inscriptions and the texts and the poems which are inscribed in them uh, during the break. I think that uh, our foot is coming slowly. So uh, we shall meet here again at 2.15 uh, for paper by Julia. And now enjoy our free time.